Charles Louis Mortgage Advisors, 0161 959 Let's start with Doug as, as, as a non-professional sports person who consumes sport and obviously has been brought up on American sport. Uh, first of all, what, what do you think are the pros and cons on, on the way your country does these things? And is it something you would want to be brought more into the game? Is soccer, football, whatever you want to call it, something that you want to protect from the, the Americanization? Um, how, how do you see this subject from your point of view? Yeah, I, I appreciate the, the question because it's, I mean, there's a million different considerations. And I think for me, you know, having like Mark, I had the opportunity, although not since the pandemic started, I had the opportunity to come over with my son three different times and saw home and away games with City and the experience of the in-person uh, at the Etihad or even in some of the other, like we, uh, we were able to go to Stoke and sit in the away fan section um, and watch City play, you know, rainy night in Stoke. Um, and it just, the experience is just unmatched in my opinion to any American sport that I've ever gone to see in person home or away in in England and it's just two hours of the most enjoyable experience that, that I've ever had and I was lucky enough to get it to do get to do it many times with my son um, Champions League Premier League home and away and uh, I feel very strongly that you know while there might be tweaks that can be made here and there I'm not a fan of seeing the game change at all, um, frankly, you know, and it's not only the American owners potentially that you're talking about, Ian, it's, you know, FIFA talking about a world cup every two years. It's this, it's that, you know, I, my yeah. biggest worry is the players, uh, you know, the already the demands. I mean, what did, what did they play last year? 60 games, 61, City, yeah. 61. And, and to me, that's the product. The product is the players. And, Certainly the stadiums like Tottenham's new stadium, certainly the Etihad, certainly some of these stadiums that it, to me enhances the experience. And that's what I look for. Um, our experience, uh, we certainly paid for it, but I, I enjoyed it. We, we were in the tunnel club one time and it was spectacular. I mean, I think that's the best sports money I've ever spent and I do it again tomorrow. And it's just the way city manages that heated seats. I mean, gosh, it was awesome. Um, but there'll be so, people listening to this, Doug, who yeah. who who actually, you know, the sort of fans who generally go regularly. So, well, there you go. There's an example of, of uh, you know, bringing in glass walls to see the players go past and mm -hmm. putting all the people in the, the best seats in the house who are not necessarily the hardened football fans. They'll yeah. use that as an example of the way that the sport is changing to exactly the thing that they don't want to happen. Well, I think, you know... Uh, the ticket prices are such that, I mean, I think the average fan, although I hear that prices are going up just like they are here in the US for any sporting venue, but I, I don't feel like for the money that I would that I did spend going to England, albeit it's not inexpensive flying to England from the US and back and spending you know, a week there, but you know, I, I thought it was well worth the, what, what we did spend and you know, sitting in the away, the away seats at Stoke same thing. Um, you know, I, I would just like to see the game not get changed drastically because I think what we have as a product right now is spectacular. I think what we get to see in the United States, in fact, it's in indicative of the contract renewal for NBC Sports to get the contract for Premier League for another, gosh, six, seven, eight years. They do a great job. You know, they use, you know, the, the, the different commentators that they have that are over there in England and yeah, I, I would have a hard time seeing it changed. I think take advantage of it with the certain situations where you have wealthy owners come in and 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 make the experience for the fan better. But I, I don't think you need to, you know, turn it into whatever we do in the Super Bowl because frankly, I I can't I can't stand that halftime show in the Super Bowl. Never have liked it. You know, I want to take my 15 minutes. I want to go get a hot chocolate or a warm cup of tea, and I want to go back and watch the rest of the match. And so. Um, uh, yeah, that's my two cents. Well, and I'll get Mark's perspective in a second because I know yeah. Mark covers a lot of sports in the States. But Rodney, you were out there in, in the uh, what late yeah. 70s, early 80s as a player. Yeah. Then you became an owner at Tampa Bay. You live yeah. out there now. Um, 
wow, you must have a fascinating in, uh, you know, insight really into this from, from all different angles. Um, indeed, I do. Um, th there are, uh, this could be a three-hour podcast, by the way. I won't take three hours, of course, but I believe that the, that the American owners in particular, and I'm, and I'm dividing the American owners away from the rest of the, uh, the oligarchs and the, um, you know, the sovereign wealth funds and all that. I'm, 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 I'm taking Americans out of that and using the comparison, and that is this. When I first came uh, to America, it was in, it was in um, uh, 1976. I left the Manchester City, and it was in March the, uh, of 1976 that I signed for the Tampa Bay Rowdies. The owner was a guy called George Steinbrenner. Uh, excuse me, excuse me, George Strawbridge. I later met George Steinbrenner that summer, right? And the thing that they, that they, they did is... They have business first. They want the business to be right first and get every aspect of the business. Now, Americans look at sport as entertainment. I think the guys would agree with me on that. It's an entertainment thing first, generally speaking. And my point about it is this, is this Ian. When I first arrived, there was a press conference and I had, you know the media was there and the fans were there. And they said, we're now going to present Rodney with these new Rodney Marsh number 10 shirt. And they held up this shirt with Marsh 10 on the back, the big number 10, and everybody applauded it. Well, about six months later, I came back to Manchester and I was interviewed by Gerald Sinstat. And he said, it was on Granada television. And he said, Rodney, what was your experience? You're back in Manchester. What was your experience? I said, Gerald, They've got to have numbers on the uh, names on the backs of shirts. They've got to have the names on the backs of the shirts. People looked at me as though I had three heads. Names on the back of the shirts in soccer? You can't do that. Well, here we are now, 40-odd 40, 40 years later. Everybody has their name on the shirt today. So that was an innovation. I've got so many more, but I'll let Mark jump in. Oh, I, think Rodney, I think Rodney is exactly right. It would probably take us three hours to do this topic justice because there are so many layers to this and it really depends on your perspective. I, you know, some of the things that we do here in the States could certainly enhance the game, but there's obviously some things that, that would be reprehensible. And as an American, I, you know, I find them reprehensible to think about starting with, you know, the super league. Why did the super league, offend people so greatly you know promotion and relegation is what this sport is you know it's the spine of this sport and you have a bunch of foreign owners who want cost certainty they don't want promotion and relegation because they want to know that they're cashing in their zillions every year and, and so you know that's that's the extreme example of of what the bad influence can be but look from a match experience point of view i mean the english game is so far superior to our sports here. It's not even close. And, and, and I'm interested to, to, you know, I remember being a kid when Rodney came over here and follow, you know, I knew him as an NASL player before I even started following city. So, you know, I, you know, Rodney Marsh of the Tampa Bay Rowdies, that's how he came into my life. And I remember there was that famous quote you had, where I think you said something to the effect of, you know, football in England is a gray game and gray weather with gray people, something like <laughs> something along those lines. But yeah. I think, I think it's the opposite now when I, when i go when i was just at three city matches and the passion is off the charts and the nba is my work sport that's the sport i cover it's so damn expensive the quote true fans are priced out of it it's filled with business people who are there to people watch and see the jumbotron and eat nachos and be there for the night out and it's not, it's until the playoffs come, it's not about the game very often in the NBA regular season. Whereas, you know, I was, again, I was just at city and, you know, for 15 minutes straight, the fans can sing the new Ruben Diaz song without stopping 15 minutes. I mean, it just, it's a level of passion you, you will never see here. And I, I know Ian, I just, I told you this story when I just saw you, but I'll, I'll repeat it again for, for our audience. Say, the first time I ever saw city play, away to Crystal Palace in 1996. I started following the club out of a magazine in 1980, but I didn't actually see them with my own eyes till 
1996, and City were getting destroyed that day, down 3-0. The whole second half, the City fans never stopped singing. And as an American, I had never seen anything like that in my life. At NFL, NBA, NHL, baseball, whatever the sport is, just nothing I had ever seen. And so I desperately hope that there are no changes that, that ever change that because you know, the atmosphere at a Premier League game is something that's magic.